Hi, Mariners Church. Welcome. If it's your first time at Mariners Online, we are so glad you're here. We'd love to learn a little more about you and how we can serve or pray for you. Please take a moment and fill out the Connect card that can be found in the chat window or at marinerschurch.org slash connect. Now, let's join in worship together.
Amen. What a blessing it is to worship with you today. My name is Gloria, and I serve in outreach as a local engagement pastor. 
Scripture tells us in Acts 20, 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. As followers of Jesus, we are invited into this journey of trusting Him with everything in our lives, including our resources. God calls us to give not because He needs our money, but because He loves us so much. When we give, we put our trust in Jesus and His ability to provide for all our needs, and we experience greater joy and peace. We're blessed as we partner in God's work in the world, and we're blessed as we grow in grace and freedom from greed. You can text the number below to give now or tap give in the Mariners app. Thank you for your partnership in the gospel. You were created to be in relationship, not only with God, but with one another. When we gather and grow in our faith together, we experience life as God intended, in community. And finding this kind of community at Mariners starts with Rooted. I invite you to join us for our next season of Rooted, launching this spring. We have online groups available by time zones so that you can experience this 10-week journey of getting connected to God, the church, and your purpose with others from your online community. You can sign up for Rooted online or at any of our congregations through the link below. In two weeks, we will be celebrating Jesus' victory over death at Easter. Good Friday and Easter at Mariners are incredible opportunities for you to invite people in your life who need the good news of Jesus. Between Good Friday and Easter, we have 20 opportunities for you to worship online with us. For more information about our services and Easter fun for your whole family surrounding the services, visit the link below. Today, we're continuing our series, Walking Through the Book, Song of Solomon. You can follow along with the sermon notes in the Mariners app, which you can download through the link below. Also on the app, we have a beautiful digital series guide available for you with spaces to fill in sermon notes. And now, let's join our pastor emeritus, Kenton Bishore, for today's message. We are on a series in the book of Song of Solomon, which I just love because it is God's wisdom to us about love and marriage. Really, it is God's wisdom and insight for us in every relationship. How do we have loving relationships? So when Eric was uh, cracking down the series, he said, I'll do the first three weeks, which was attraction, pursuit, dating, and marriage. He said to Jared, I, I think you should do uh, the next one, the fourth one, because that's on marriage and sex. And your wife says that you know the most about sex. Or maybe he said that your wife said you need to learn about sex. Either way, he did the last one. And so what I get to do this week, which is about conflict in marriage, which is amazing because, I mean, God talks to us as soon as they have, you have this loving couple, they get married, right away, there is a conflict. Look at what it says in the Song of Psalms, verse five, verses two through four. I slept, but my heart was awake. When I heard my lover knocking and calling, open to me my treasure, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with dampness of the night. Remember, this is a song, but I responded, I have taken off my robe. Should I get dressed again? I have washed my feet. Should I get them spoiled? I have a headache in so many words. My lover tried to unlatch the door. My heart thrilled within me. Here, right away, we see that there is conflict in the marriage. And we understand the story. I mean, it's kind of implied. She and her heart saying, you know what, he's been busy. They got married and he promised that she would be absolutely the most important person. She would have first place. But now work has started to take first place in her in his life. And she's identified it. She's pointed it out and said, look, at, it seems like all of the best energy that you have is going towards work. And he's tried to explain it. He said, look, at, I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing it for us. I just want us to have financial security. And I'm just trying to create, you know, it's not about my need for success. It's for you, he says. But she doesn't buy it. And so after a long day of work, he shows up at the door, you know, in the first century, the king and the queen lived in two different chambers. And so he knocks on the door. He's got flowers in his hand. He's working and he says, honey, babe, open the door. 
To which her response is, it's late. It's too late, buddy. In fact, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get out of bed. You know, I have a headache or whatever it is. And clearly you can see that there's a lot of pain and it could be on the other side. It could be on the guy's side. It's like, you know, say Joe and Sue, you know, they've been a, a busy that's couple. Things have been going on, a lot of work, school, uh, kids activities. And so Joe's a little concerned that there's a drift in their relationship. And so he sees it and he says to his wife, let's go to dinner Friday night. Let's have a date night without the kids. Let's just you and I be together. And so he says, I'll, you know, I'll take care of the reservations." So he goes online, he makes reservations. Sue, his wife, calls one babysitter, can't get a babysitter, calls a second babysitter, texts the third one. Finally, one babysitter texts back, I think I can do it. And so Friday rolls around and right before the time of the date, the babysitter says, I can't make it. She frantically tries to find another, but she can't find it. So Joe, who is disappointed, comes home and something dark happens in his heart. And he walks in and he says, did you try to call somebody else? And he's thinking, I did my part. I mean, I made reservations. And then he asks this question, what did you do all day? And of course, right away, her hackles go up and she's thinking, what did I do all day? And so then Joe crashes on the couch and he puts a do not disturb sign over his forehead and he just starts watching TV. Sue thinks, you wanna hear about my day? I'll tell you about my day. And so she starts to explain about her day, but Joe's not listening and she thinks in her, in her mind, you don't treasure me. You don't value me. You promised that I would be first place. And now your job takes the most important time in our life. And so she finally gets disgusted. She goes upstairs and says, I've got a headache. Joe's down there on the couch thinking if she just would admit that she didn't try. And she's thinking if he would just admit, you know, that he doesn't care. And so the two of them are isolated and alone. And so right away we see there's conflict in marriage. And for people, conflict surprises people. Sometimes they think that there shouldn't be conflict in relationships or that conflict's bad, but you understand that we are built for conflict. All relationships have conflict. God designed us for conflict. How do I know? Well, in the very beginning of the Bible, what does it say? God created humanity. And how did he create humanity? Man and a woman, maleness and femaleness conflict right there. And so you have a man and a woman, they come into marriage and they think absolutely different. You know, they're different. They have a different perspective. They look at life different. They're built different. They have different values. And then right away, you have built into the relationship conflict. And the idea behind it is that they are to complement each other. They're, they are to be different. And there's so many books that are written about it. There's a book that's long time ago. It says, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. His Needs, Her Needs is another book, which just talks about the difference in femininity and masculinity. And so why is conflict necessary? Why did God make the difference? Well, to complement each other. The differences automatically causes us to build love. That conflict is designed to build love because what is love? Well, love is patience. Well, you, without conflict, you have no need for patience. You're not going to develop patience. Patience is the ability to look at another person and say, wait, I, I don't understand it that way. Let me try to see it through your eyes. Love is kind and accepting. It's encouraging difference. It's saying, I like that in you and I want to build into that. Uh, it doesn't demand your own way. And so it's not saying, wait, you have to think like I think. You have to be like I am. I mean, everything about love is uh, about... Uh, conflict is designed to build love into our relationship. I need conflict to become a loving person. My wife needs conflict to be a loving person. We need that conflict to be a loving person. And God didn't just build conflict between men and women. Personalities bring conflict. I mean, people are different. And so you have some people that are introverts. They gain energy by being themselves. And then some people gain energy by being around lots of people. There are people who are task oriented. They get the world moving, they get things done, we accomplish things. Then there's others who are relationship. They, they're, they're warm hearted and they, they care about people and get in the way, just kidding. And then there's open-ended people, you know, people who love to process. That's what my wife, she, she can process, 
And I'm like, let's just make a decision, close-ended people. There's morning people, there's night people, there's truth and justice people, there's mercy and compassionate. We are built different. And in, in just the idea that we all are different kinds of people, again, it creates conflict. And if that wasn't all, then on top of it, what happened is we sin. Sin is the story of the brokenness in the world. God created us and he created us to live in a world of love and relationship, to live in loving relationship with God and with each other. Still, there would be conflict, but it was designed within loving relationship. But even though God created a perfect world, we didn't like it the way that God created it. We wanted life on our own terms. And because of our selfishness, we damaged our relationship with God and with each other. Our selfishness, I mean, our sin, supercharged selfishness in our life. So now we are broken people. And so what does sin do with difference? I mean, God designed the difference, but now sin, it just ramps it up and it makes difference wrong. We compare with each other. We compete with each other. We're jealous of each other. We tend to judge the difference in another person. We're impatient with people. Why are you doing it that way? Why aren't you doing it my way? We're unkind. And so we live in a broken world where we hurt each other because of sin. And so our selfishness is just so easy to see and it just, it damages relationship, but it makes conflict more intense, gives us more an opportunity to learn to love. I read a study about men and women and it was interesting because they test and they ask uh, men, what were their ideal soulmate, their de- ideal spouse? And so guys said physically, they wanted a, a gal that was physically attractive, there had to be sexual chemistry, uh, compatibility. Now listen to these statements. Someone who will take me as I am, see me as not needing any change, fit into my life and become more like me. Okay, that's what men want. So then what they ask women, what do you want? They want someone who is fun, intellectually stimulating, somebody who's sexually attractive. They wanted someone who had common interests. Now listen to these. Somebody who had the ability to anticipate my interests, support my goals, and be like me. So the ideal person to everyone is me. Me, I'm the ideal person. And so we don't want any difference. We don't want any conflict. We just want somebody like me. But God said, no, it doesn't, that's not the purpose of it. You have to become a loving person. None of us would become loving if we just were around ourselves. We would become, I mean, that's self-centered, selfish. Um, it's, it happened to me in my marriage. I did what everyone does in their marriage. Now I got married and Lori, who is my spouse, I mean, she is, she is wonderful. She was perfect. She is all of those things. She was exciting and stimulating. I mean, I mean, she was so exciting to be around. And three things happened. And these three things happened to everyone who gets married. The first thing that happened is that I began to discover how selfish Lori is. I was shocked. I mean, she wanted, she had her own opinions. She wanted things her own way. She didn't want to hear me explain things. She didn't want me to help her understand how I saw things. She just wanted me to see things her way. And I was amazed, actually startled at her her selfishness. And the second thing that happened is I began to realize that she was having the same uh, discovery. She was aware of my selfishness. And so she's going, you want your way. You, you know, you just keep you thinking that things should be your way. So she was a little disappointed in that. Both of those are dangerous. But the third thing that I did was the most lethal. And this is what everyone does in every relationship and really what is lethal to marriages. So, you know, I'm aware of my spouse's selfishness, they're aware of mine, but the third thing that is most lethal is this. I decided that Lori's selfishness was the bigger problem. It's hers. I mean, the problem in our marriage was that Lori was selfish. And because she has the bigger problem, then what I needed to do is I needed to help her change. So I offered just a little constructive criticism. I offered little helpful hints on things that she could do. Not only did I do that, but I began to take seriously prayer. So I went to God in prayer and I'm saying, God, you need to change her. You need to fix her. You need to fix this. I mean, and I, I, I went on an all out. I would pray. I would fast because, you know, her selfishness was the issue. I wanted to help her understand that. And so I'm trying to get her to change. 
And at the same time, Lori was doing the same thing, which got us to go nowhere. And so one of the things that I want you to lock on this, if there's anything that I could help you with is, is this lesson. That was the biggest waste of time that I've ever spent in my life doing anything, was trying to change my wife, focusing on her, believing that her selfishness was the biggest problem. And I came to what I think is the most important insight. It's all through the Bible, but I believe this is one of life's most important lessons. And here's what I learned. My selfishness is the biggest, it's the fundamental problem in, in relationships. My selfishness is the fundamental problem in my marriage. It is the fundamental problem in my relationships with my kids. It is the fundamental problem in my relationships with my friends. It is my selfishness. Just want you to think that because until you can say that, my selfishness is the fundamental problem in relationship, you are never going to move forward. You are never going to understand what conflict does for you and how you can build love in conflict. And here's the good news about that. You have complete access to your selfishness and you have complete responsibility for your selfishness. And it only takes one person to deal with your selfishness and you're the one. Isn't that beautiful? So one person to deal with it and you're the one and God wants to work in your life to help you not be selfish. And so conflict is normal in all relationships. You can see it's built by God, designed by God. Sin spins it and really ramps it up. So there's a lot of confusion around it and it causes more hurt, but it just supercharges selfishness. But what we must learn to do is to manage to work through conflict in a respectful way, in an honoring way, in a loving way, building love, People who cannot figure out how to manage conflict, they've done tons of study on this. People who fight all the time, and literally fighting all the time is a five to one ratio. If you have five negatives to one positive, they're saying you're fighting all the time, you're destroying your marriage and it won't last. Or if you never fight, which is you just, there's 11 positives to one negative, you just can't manage negative, that destroys relationship. Do you know what healthy relationships do? They have good fights. They have good fights over good issues, important issues, meaningful issues. And what's most important to understand is that that's how you build love. Your marriage needs conflict and you to struggle through issues. You need it so that you build love. Your spouse needs it. Your kids need to see you have conflict so they understand it doesn't destroy relationships. This is how love is built. You can have conflict, deal with hard and important matters, and at the end of it, still come back together and still have a strong marriage. People need to see it. You need it in your life. So we need to learn to fight for the good. Well, what does that mean? Because you can fight for the bad. I mean, you just walk away or you fight too hard. You've got to have rules in fighting. Uh, one of my favorite stories about fighting, I learned from a rancher in Texas. And ranchers, you know, they, they just, they learn by observing. And this rancher raised deer in West Texas where there's nothing forever, you know, it's just land forever, not valuable land. And so they can grow deer because they can kind of go off by themselves. And they raise deer for the meat and for the hide. But in the 70s or the 60s, they actually uh, began to grind, they, they found out that the antlers were more valuable than the whole animal because if you ground them out, there were certain uh, peoples that would buy that because they, they believed it to be an aphrodisiac. So they sold it, uh, the antlers ground up. So more valuable than the whole animal. So of course, ranchers are you know cutting the antlers off of animals. And this one rancher noticed that what happened when he cut the antlers off of all of um, the male deer, that the size of the herd went down. So the number of animals in a herd significantly reduced and the size of each animal in the herd significantly reduced. And so he looked at that and said, why is this? And he reasoned, this was the reason, is that deer, when they want to establish a leadership order in a herd, two male deer bucks will get together. They, they literally lock antlers and they wrestle. And the strongest 
and the most powerful and the wisest animal becomes the leader when you have antlers and they wrestle. When they cut the antlers off, what they found out is the meanest animal would win the fight because it was crazy and just would smash headlong in. And the smart animals are going, I'm not have a part of this. And so there is no beauty in just fighting is the point. The beauty is in locking antlers and struggling when there's boundaries and you fight a good fight and there is an outcome. But if you don't have good boundaries, the mean person will win. And ultimately when that's the case, people just walk away. So what does it look like to have a good fight? Well, here's what I love in this passage. The next thing is that it points out that you have two choices. You can fight for good or you can just let it destroy you. And so he says, what the next verses do is they point out how a conflict destroys. What you're gonna read, remember, this is poetry. The way conflict destroys is it isolates us and then we make bad choices in that isolation. Look at the story. Now this, this, this part of it, theologian says, is kind of a dream sequence and you'll see why. It says, the woman said, I jumped to open, I jumped up to open the door for my love and my hands dripped with perfume. My fingers dripped with lovely myrrh. As I pulled back the bolt, I opened to my lover, but he was gone. My heart sank. Then it says, I searched for him. And so she is actually leaves and she goes out into the city. This is why it's a dream sequence. But I could not find him anywhere. I called to him, but there was no reply. The night watchman, so now she's out on the night, she's on the street at night. The night watchman found me as they made their rounds. They beat me and bruised me and stripped me of my veil, clearly, you know, dishonoring her, those watchmen on the walls. So there's two things that happen. The first thing that happens is that when you don't manage conflict, it isolates you. And then the second thing is you make really bad decisions. So first of all, how does it isolate you? Well, it's right in the story. The woman gets isolated because she's she gets hurt first. You know, her husband's not paying attention to her. He's letting work take the first place. She gets angry and anger is the second step. And I just wanna point out, the Bible talks a lot about anger. Anger is not someone else's fault. Anger, the Bible tells us, comes from our own hearts, our own brokenness. And the most important thing to understand about anger, Ephesians says, is that literally you're opening the door to Satan to the problem. And he's gonna come in and he's gonna wreak hell into the situation. And so anger looks like this. She's going, he doesn't put me first. He's never gonna put me first. It's always work with him. He doesn't care. And so now that anger is stirred up into bitterness and resentment. He doesn't love me. He doesn't look at me. He doesn't think that I'm lovable. And then revenge. I'll show him what it feels like not to be loved. And she locks the door. Same story for him. What's him? He's hurt. He's been working. He's saying, I'm just doing my best. I'm trying to provide for you. I've been working all day. And so then he comes to the door. He's got flowers in his hands. And then the door's locked. Immediately there's anger. It's like, what? You never respond. You are always critical. You're just a cold hearted person. So then bitterness and resentment goes, I've tried and it's never enough with you. you all you do is you, you, you focus on my faults. He takes the flowers. He throws them down on the ground. She says, you want to be alone? Fine, you be alone. And he leaves. And it makes perfect sense. You see what I mean? So we get hurt. We get angry. We pull away. We isolate. Then in bitterness and resentment, we're in our own thoughts. And as a result of it, it makes perfect sense. Whose fault is it? It's her fault. Whose fault is it? It's his fault. And it's the summary that it says, their selfishness is the biggest problem in my marriage, in our marriage. It's their selfishness that's the problem. So first thing that we do is we isolate. We're left with our own thinking. And in our own thinking, we just pull away and it makes total sense to us. Now, why is that so dangerous? Because then we make crazy decisions. What's the crazy decisions that she makes? She goes out into the city at night. The only people that go out in the city at nights are criminals and prostitutes. The watchman on the wall beat her, which is, you know, basically ruins her life. And then they tear off her veil, which is to ruin her reputation. And so it destroys basically her marriage. And you go, what's the point? Well, it's obvious what the point is. And we've seen it happen. You've seen it happen over and over again. This is what the story goes like. One of them is hurt. You know, you've seen people, they go out when they've been hurt. 
and they're angry, they're bitter and resentful, they go out and they all of a sudden run into somebody who sparkles at them, who, you know, pays attention to them, who listens to them, and then begins to be attracted towards them. All those hormones get, you know, spinning up in their life. And so they've got ox, uh, oxytocin and dopamine and serotonin that starts dumping into their system and they're thinking, you know what, I feel attractive, I feel love. And so they kicked in and then it's a forbidden love, which is an illicit love, which makes it even more exciting. And it goes little by little and then all at once, there's an affair and it blows up marriage. I was listening on a podcast to Shaquille O'Neal talk to Jason Kelsey and he was thinking about retiring. And Shaquille O'Neal said this to Jason Kelsey. He said, he goes, don't do what I do. Don't do what I did. He goes, when I was playing basketball, I thought I was the king of the world. He goes, I cheated on my wife. And he goes, and I ruined my life. I literally live in a 100,000 square foot home all by myself. I ruined my life. Don't do what I did. That's what the warning is in this story. You get isolated and alone. You think you're hurt and there's anger and bitterness and resentment. You are in a dangerous situation. And what this, what God clearly points out is you go acting out on that you will destroy your whole life. You'll destroy your reputation. You will destroy love. So he's saying, you better manage conflict right because if you don't manage conflict right, you are alone and you make bad choices. So how do you manage conflict well? Now, before I read these verses, I wanna just ask you this. How are you gonna respond to what God says? Are you gonna listen to it and say, I'll consider it? Because I guarantee you, there's gonna be a whole lot of you that are gonna think, that's not me, I can't do that. And if that's really how you're gonna respond, I mean, you gotta think that God's gonna give you, this is how you are to build love in your life, to build love into your marriage. So how are you gonna respond? Are you gonna say, God, you say it, I'm gonna do it? Or are you saying, well, I'll consider, I'll think about it. I mean, really, are you gonna do what God says here? Because what he asks us to do is incredibly clear but it's very challenging to do. So look at what God says in this passage. And basically he's saying in conflict, when you have conflict, you need to commit to loving the person. So look at what it says in 5.8. It says, make this promise, O woman of Israel, if you find my lover, tell him I'm weak with love. Here she's proclaiming her love to her friends. Then in the next verse, it says, my lover has gone down to his garden, to his spice beds, to browse in the gardens, to gather the lilies. Here's the great line. I am my lover's and my lover is mine. He browses among the lilies. She says it to her friends. She says it to herself. She says, look at I, she recommits love. And this is the courageous decision of commitment. What do you do in conflict? You make the courageous decision to say, I'm gonna love you without guarantees. I'm gonna love you without a net. I'm gonna risk, even though this might hurt, I am going to connect in love. I'm going to tell you I love you. I am not gonna pull away. I am not gonna let this isolate, let it isolate us. This is what the Bible talks about as covenant love. This is the kind of love that God gives us. It is a love that goes first. It's a willing to take a risk. It says it's radical giving. It is a loving without guarantees. Contract love is the love that everybody tries to do. Contract love is not love at all. It's, it's, it's wanting to manage the uncertainties of life. What, you know, I need to know, I need guarantees. I know that you'll love me, I need certainty. That's not what love is. And so it is this declaration of covenant love that says, I am going to love you. It is, it is the willingness to write a poem, to write a card, to sing a song, and to say, you know what, I love you. So what would it look like for you to do this first thing? To write a card. Now, I love this because I go, you need to write a card and tell your wife how much you love them. And you go, you need to write a poem. You need to sing a song. To which most people say, that's not me. I don't do that. You know, I, I just don't do that. But what does he say? This is a song that is written. And so God is saying to us, what you need to do in marriage to your spouse is you need to write a song, you need to sing a song, you need to write cards and declare your love. So what would it look like for you, even in conflict, to declare your love, to say, I love you so much, not in a trite way, to say it. I'll tell you what I do. I do this all the time. Now I do this before conflict so that, you know, in conflict, I can do it. I come home a lot and uh, I love 
uh, Alexa, because I say, Alexa, play John Legend, um, all of me. And so the song comes on. And so as it goes through, I sing and I sing really badly. And I, I sing the I sing the middle part to Lori because she's usually in the house and I'm singing as I walk into the house. Because all of you loves, wait, because all of me loves all of you, loves all your curves and edges, loves your perfect imperfections. Uh, I'll give my all to you. You give your all to me. <laughs> I wish I could sing it. But he goes, he goes and uh, you're my end and my beginning. Even when I lose, I'm winning because I give my all to you. I sing that song at the top of my lungs to, uh, to my wife uh, when I come into the door. And do you know what? 90% of the time, she comes up to me and she starts dancing with me. I've tried to write cards. I write terrible cards, but she loves every card that I write because I wrote it. I guarantee you, your spouse will love the cards that you write. The first thing that God says that you need to do in conflict is that even before it comes, you need to live a life where you are committing your love, you are recommitting your love, you're saying it to your spouse, you're saying it in front of your friends, you're announcing it to the world, you're announcing it to yourself. You sing, all of me, thanks, all, loves all of you, or however you do that, and you're saying, this is what it means for me to love you. It's the first thing that God says in conflict. You gonna do it? Are you gonna just go, no, no, that's not me. I said it once. I said it once when we got married. I don't need a card. You need to write the card. You need to write poetry. You need to do the best that you can. Now, the second thing that he does that God says, which is amazing in this passage, and again, are you gonna do what God says? It's be very clear. It's a very simple discipline, but it says in conflict, here's what you're supposed to do. Basically, you're to celebrate the positives. Now, in this, I'm going to read it kind of quick because this is Hebrew poetry. I mean, you got to remember, it's written in poetry. So it's written in a different language to a different time and a different culture. So when you get lost in it, you get lost because you go, I'd never say that. Well, of course, you'd never say it this way, but get the big point. So look at what she says first. She goes, why is your lover better than all others? They're asking the woman this, and the, a woman of rare beauty. What makes your lover so special? Now, look at what she affirms him for. My lover is dark and dazzling. He's better than 10,000 others. His head. Now, you might not say he's the finest gold, but she's, she's affirming his head and his wavy hair. You look at it, he goes, 10 out, his head is gold. His wavy hair, you know, and he talks about the wavy hair. His eyes sparkle. You know, you might not choose those words, you know, but they're like jewels. Washed in milk makes no sense. But the idea is his cheeks, and then going on, it says his lips are like his arms are, his body is, his legs are, his posture is, his mouth is. Do you see the whole point is she's just identifying the things that she loves about him. And then he goes on and he responds, you're my darling. Uh, like the lovely city, he compares her to a city. He says, you're as beautiful as Jerusalem. He goes, you are majestic. And then but the idea is she's majestic. Your eyes, you know, as they turn to me, they, they overpower me. Your hair falls. And it, it doesn't matter how he says it, but the idea of he affirms her hair, your teeth, your smile, your smile is flesh, your cheeks. He goes on and talks about your cheeks. He goes, I would choose you over a thousand women. You know, you're my dove. The whole point is she's just, he's affirming her. He's affirming, uh, he's affirming her. He, she's affirming him. So, What's the point? The first point is, the, the point of it is to focus on the positives. And so what happens when you focus on the positives? You're literally, it's the discipline of noticing. I love this, I love this about you, I love that. You're taking your mind off of the negatives. You're focusing on the positives in this. You're reminding yourself. And do you know what happens when you focus on the positives in a person? Biologically, literally, your brain releases oxytocin, dopamine, and serotonin which are called the love hormones. And what it does is it literally creates positive emotions, it creates empathy, trust, feelings of gratitude. It makes your partner more attractive to you. So you spend more time with them, which makes them even more attractive to them so that you love them more and you get lucky more often. You are able to, uh, it creates overall stability and it reduces your stress. When you affirm somebody, look at what it does. It literally changes your perspective and it changes your brain chemistry. I do this. I do this 
I do this on a regular basis, but four times a year, I go big with this. So early on, on my anniversary, I began to write down the reasons that I loved Lori. And so we've been married 47 years. So I have a list that's over 47 reasons long, just about that. I keep that list in my journal. And so every time an anniversary comes around, I read through that list and I choose about 10 things about why I love her and I write them down. I give them to her as a card. I rework them each time. She loves it. And not only do I that, she has a birthday every year and her birthday, she's well over 47. And so I have a reason that I love her for every birthday. And so, and that list is the same list. I just keep this list. I've got this long list of all the reasons why I love Lori. Every birthday, I write her a card and I affirm her in front of my kids why I love her. And again, I write 10 or 12 reasons. Anniversaries, birthdays, every Valentine's Day, I pull that out and I go through it and I write down the list of what it is. And then on Mother's Days, I do it too. She knows that I have the list. She loves that I have the list because I look at that list on a regular basis and it, and I, and I, I just, what happens? I'm focusing on all the reasons why I love her. And at the same time, it's reducing all of these great hormones in my brain so that it even makes me love her more. And so it is a great thing. So my question is, what would it look like for you to create a list? You go, I don't have a list. Well, just sit down and write 10. And if you've been married 10 years, then write a card, put the 10 reasons, and then just start building it like I did. And you've got four reasons every, you know, you've got Valentine's Day, birthday, you've got Mother's Day, you've got uh, the other one in there, birthday, anniversary, anniversaries. And so you've got, you know, reasons to go back to that list and write it. Because look at what God says in this passage. He goes, he goes look at, I, I build conflict in. Conflict is not meant to destroy you. It is meant to build love in your relationship. It can destroy you if you're not careful. If you think that self, you know, that it's the other person's selfishness that's really the problem, you're the problem here. And he goes, and there's danger. If you let conflict destroy, it'll spin your life out. But if you will just do what God says in this passage, it will change your life. So what is God saying? What has he said to you uh, in, this, in this message? You know, hopefully maybe for some of you, you would just say, my selfishness, is the biggest problem in my marriage or in my relationship or in a broken relationship it is my selfishness. And maybe for you, what you need to pray is say, God, I need a miracle in my life. I need you to break the selfishness in my life. For others of you, you might say it's anger. You know, I get, I tend to let conflict just spin me out. And as a result of it, anger just isolates me. And when it does, you are in a very dangerous place. And so your prayer might be, God, would you save me from my anger? This anger is going to destroy me. It's going to destroy my, my marriage. It's going to destroy my life. Maybe third, what you need to do is you need to commit, recommit, write a card, write a poem, sing a song to your spouse, and just recommit your love. Say, you know what? I love you. I mean, all of me loves all of you. I mean, just sing John Legend's song to her or to him and do that. Or maybe what you need to do is to say, I need to create a list, like God says, because I'm letting conflict destroy my marriage. I need to focus on all of the reasons why I love my spouse. What is it that you've heard from God? You know, if you want someone to pray with you, you can just text the number that you see on the screen. And we would love to pray any one of these prayers God, I need a miracle in my anger. God, I need a miracle in on my marriage. God, I need to change my view of selfishness. We want to do that for you. Will you pray with me? Father, would you help us become loving people and build love into our hearts and souls, even in the conflict of life that's designed to just build love? God, would you do that? We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Too long on
to bear it alone I hear your invitation To let it all go I'll see it now I'm laying it down And I know that I need you I run to the far I fall into grace I'm done out your hands and receive God's blessing. Father, look at your children. They love you. Would you bless them and keep them? Would you cause your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them? Would you lift up the light of your countenance? Would you turn your attention towards them and listen as they cry out? And would you answer their prayers? And God, would you give them peace? We ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in God's grace.